Alison Carr, Rob Waddell, Desiree Ramirez, Paul Wagle. All four enjoy productive, active lives, and they all had their lives saved or dramatically transformed by a stem cell transplant. Allison's body was crippled by multiple sclerosis, Rob's with kidney disease, Desiree suffered excruciating pain from sickle cell, and Paul almost died from cancer. To see them thrive today is why scientists, researchers, and doctors have dedicated their lives and billions of dollars to stem cell research. Ultimately, biomedical research is about developing better ways of caring for people who have pain and injury and disease. The earliest indications of adult stem cells came back in the early 1900s. There were more clues that our body had these flexible cells, repair kits, if you will, from survivors of the atomic bomb blasts. Then in the 1950s, doctors discovered they could cure some forms of cancer with stem cells from bone marrow. So there's a great history and many, many applications for blood and marrow-derived repair. Things like leukemias, anemias, and so on. Autoimmune diseases has seen an explosion in terms of successful treatments. There's some really interesting things where they've been using adult stem cells and restore vision. But the ones that tend to fire up people's imaginations more are when you start to repair a spinal cord injury, stroke repair, are you kidding me? Now, with adult stem cell applications, being able to get that person up, walking, living a full life. The extraordinary treatments listed by Dr. Prentice were achieved using adult stem cells, harvested from bone marrow, umbilical cord blood, or the patient's own mature body. But just before the turn of the 21st century, scientists made a breakthrough with a new kind of stem cell named embryonic stem cells because they were harvested from human embryos, these stem cells had seemingly unlimited potential to create any organ and treat any disease. There is all sorts of excitement. And, and you can look back and understand why. The idea was these are cells which can make lots of different kinds of tissues. The expectations for embryonic stem cells when they were first grown successfully in the laboratory, which was 1998, were astronomical. But with the excitement came a sobering realization. To advance embryonic stem cell research, scientists learned that the embryos would be destroyed in the process of harvesting the stem cells. This created a moral and ethical dilemma for doctors and the scientific community. The research was allowed to continue but after 20 years, the ethical problem wasn't even the biggest challenge. Some scientists thought their amazing flexibility would be a good target to get them and try and use for clinical treatments. But as it turns out, they're very hard to control. They're hard to tame, if you will, to produce the type of cell replacement for a damaged tissue. The problem is embryonic stem cells like to grow too much Whenever scientists try to coax them to just grow a certain type of damaged cell or tissue, they grow uncontrollably. They tend to form tumors instead of forming the type of tissue you want. And those tumors are malformations of multiple different kinds of tissues. They're called teratomas. That feature is their biology. That's what they do. They make lots of different things and out of the environment of the embryo, but they do it in very bizarre and problematic ways. Dr. Shirley likens it to asking a home builder to come into your house and repair a plumbing issue. You'd think the builder would know how to fix a leak, but all he knows how to do is build from scratch. They come into your house and make all kinds of stuff you don't even need, right? You have plumbing going out your window. That, that builder, if you said, I want you to build me a new house, well, that's what they'd be able to do. But you come in and put them in your house for your one problem, it's a disaster. Hundreds of millions of research dollars have been poured into embryonic stem cell research over the past 20 years. And while some advances have been made in basic research and involving lab animals, every time stem cells derived from embryos are transplanted into humans, the coveted breakthrough treatments have failed. 
The promise was we were going to get cures and therapies from this. The problem with embryonic stem cell research is that that statement wasn't true. As long as people were talking about putting those cells into people's bodies because they can't renew. There are no published scientific papers that document and validate an actual success with embryonic stem cells. Many researchers continue to look for the key to unlock the potential of embryonic stem cells, but some have found the ethical and moral issues too troubling to ignore. One is Dr. Tara Sander Lee. As a researcher, she was able to find ethical alternatives to working with questionable cell lines, but she still had to face the issue in her personal life. You know, I myself actually had problems with infertility and had gone through in vitro fertilization. And I learned about this technique called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD, in which families that were undergoing in vitro fertilization could have their embryos undergo genetic testing. And if they determined that they didn't like the genotype of that child, they would discard them or they would be donated to research where then they would be destroyed. It just it was devastating to me because to me, every, every embryo from day one was precious. Paul Wagle is a clinical ethicist for a major Midwestern hospital system and brings a unique perspective. As a child, he had to endure chemotherapy and treatment for leukemia, not once, but twice. The second time, he received an adult stem cell transplant from umbilical cord blood. What adult stem cell transplants given me was an opportunity, an opportunity to experience life. Wagel says the ethical question affects much more than just researchers and scientists. Ethics is always fun when it's theoretical, but when you're confronted with the patient that it actually affects, it's gut-wrenching. At what cost are we willing to find the, these cures or potential cures from embryonic stem cells? Do we want to live in a world where, you know, the ends justify the means and that we can do anything as long as it has good outcomes? Where we can sacrifice one person for another? Where we can enslave one person so that another person can be free? Having being born in this country as an African-American and having grown up uh, and lived through my life here, racism has always been a part of it. That's what we're doing. We're basically saying some humans get to decide what happens to other humans without their permission for the benefit of themselves. Ironically, Wagle, the ethicist, says he sees the question not just from his moral view, but from his understanding of science as well. After conception, there is a, a physiological difference between the preceding cells. This physiological difference is recognized by biology by calling it a completely different name. It's called a zygote. And if we left that zygote to natural, healthy, normal circumstances, this zygote will become a walking, talking, feeling human person. And who am I to obstruct that natural process? Who am I to play God and to say that this cycle is not appropriate for that particular individual? A heated debate between opponents and supporters of embryonic stem cell research erupted quickly and has continued for years. But in 2006, a Japanese scientist and his team made a breakthrough that seemed to eliminate the ethical question from the stem cell debate. Dr. Shinya Yamanaka discovered induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPS cells. He found that he could add some factors to an ordinary cell, not any stem cell, just an ordinary cell like a skin cell, and induce them, persuade them if you will, reprogram them to look and act like an embryonic stem cell. Induced pluripotent stem cells. What do they do? They do everything that embryonic stem cells can do, but they don't come from embryos and no embryo is destroyed in order to make them. Dr. Yamanaka was awarded a Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking work, but the father of two said his motivation was much more personal. He said, when I saw the embryo, I suddenly realized there was such a small difference between it and my daughters. 
I thought, we can't keep destroying embryos for our research. There must be another way. In just 15 years, the study of iPS cells has led to a number of discoveries in drug testing and basic research, even a few early treatments in humans that appear promising. Dr. Sander Lee sees the scientific community moving away from embryonic stem cell research. So scientists follow the best science, NIH funds the best science, and it's clear that the most money is going to adult stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. Today, of the almost $1.6 billion spent on all stem cell research, IPS and adult stem cells make up 80% of the funding. Embryonic, only 20%. So I think the end is in sight for embryonic. There's still gonna be some people that wanna hang on to it, but if we're focused on the patients and we're focused on new treatments, it's gonna be the adult stem cells and the iPS cells that are gonna to continue to move to the fore. And in the next 20 years, I see more optimization in the generation and delivery of adult stem cell therapies. We're gonna be obtaining more answers about how to optimize this therapy and it's only going to improve and get better and save more lives.